Hi, Ethan. Hey. Who do we have today for story time? Green Tree. Is Green Tree a bunny? Mm-hmm. And tell me about her. She's scared of the dark, but the only time she's not scared of the dark is when she's with me. She's freaked out about the vacuum. About the vacuum cleaner? <laughs> scares her. And what do, you, what do you have today to read to her? This book. Little One God Loves Me. Go ahead, let's start. Little one, God loves you. Little one, little one, do you know? Do you know God loves you so? I do, Mama. Can you see? God made you for his family. Little one, little one, on the go. God's the one who helps you grow. Little one, little one, show your care. Be God's helper everywhere. Little one, little one, God loves you. Share God's love with others too. Little one, little one, say a prayer. Thank God for his love and care. See it, green tree? The end. Thank you, Ethan. All right. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 12 verses 1 through 8. As we often do, we're going to go through it verse by verse, so the scripture reading will actually be incorporated into the sermon this morning. I encourage you to follow along in your Bibles or use your cell phone or a tablet to Google search Psalm 12 so that you can follow along as we go through it. Now as we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A man is on an airplane flight from El Paso to Dallas, and he opens his bag of peanuts that come with every flight. Immediately, he hears a voice coming from the bag, and the voice says, Hey man, you're looking great today. The man looks around, but no one else seems to have heard or noticed, and not wanting to be rude, the man says, Uh, thank you? 
The peanuts reply, also, I really love your outfit. That's uh, nice of you, says the man. Next, the bag of peanuts tells him, you are one of the coolest guys I've ever met. At this, the man is beginning to be quite flattered. So he waves down the flight attendant and tells her, ma'am, these peanuts are really nice and thoughtful. The flight attendant replies, well, they should be. After all, they are complimentary. Psalm 12. Psalm 12 is about flattery, boasting, and other types of deceitful or reckless speech. There's an old saying that most of us grew up with. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. Of course, the mere existence of that rhyme, the fact that children need words like this to comfort and console themselves, that hints at the fact that, yeah, actually words really do have the power to wound us deeply, to destroy relationships and reputations alike. Psalm 12 says in the instructions at the beginning of the psalm that it is a psalm of David, written to the leader or the chief musician, to be accompanied by the sheminith. Sheminith is a Hebrew word that means eight and probably refers to this instrument. It's an eight-stringed traditional Jewish kinnor harp. So, that's what the psalm would have been accompanied by, we think. A psalm of David could mean that it was written by the famous King David himself or by someone else in the style of King David. But whoever wrote this psalm was clearly having a bad day or a bad year or a bad decade. There are no flowery, poetic, introductory words like we find in some other psalms at the beginning of the psalm, just a simple and heartfelt cry, two words, help, O Lord. Yes, I know in English that's three words, but in Hebrew it's two words, help, Lord. If you ever need a good way to start a prayer on a bad day, that will do. Help, O Lord. For there is no longer anyone who is godly. The faithful have disappeared from humankind. Now that part may sound like a little bit of an exaggeration, and it probably is. But it's also a reminder to us that when we feel like the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, when we feel like things have never been as bad as they are today, well, we're not alone in that sentiment. People have been feeling that way for generations, going back at least 3,000 years when this psalm was probably written. Remembering that fact may not help your situation, but it does put things in a larger perspective. Verse 2. They, that is everyone, utter lies to each other. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. The word translated as lies in Hebrew is shav, which literally means emptiness, or words with no substance, no value. The phrase double heart is a lot like our modern day expression two-faced. So people who say one thing in front of you, that's one face, one heart, and quite a different thing when they are not around you, about you. That's the other heart and the other face. If verses 1 and 2 spell out what the problem is that the psalmist has, verse 3 and verse 4 are the psalmist's actual prayer, his request to God. He says, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts, those who say, with our tongues we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is our master? Basically, He's describing four different kinds of destructive speech and praying that God will cut off that from his experience. The first kind of destructive speech is flattering lips. Think of how you feel when someone praises you, when someone compliments you. Feels good, right? 
And then how do you feel when you learn later on that none of those things were actually true, that they were only an attempt to gain something from you? Not so good. Flattery is probably the most innocuous kind of deceitful speech. We do this without thinking about it or without even realizing we're doing it. You might even flatter someone simply because you just want them to like you a little better. What's the harm in that, right? Well, the harm is in the deception. Flattery pretends to say, I love you, but it's really saying, I love me. The scriptures teach us that true love, true kindness, true generosity is never self-seeking. It is self-sacrificing. And so the antidote to flattery is not to stop complimenting people or, on the other hand, to be brutally honest or rude. No, the antidote to flattery is to actually mean and believe your compliments that you give to others and then stand by your words in the presence of other people. Make your two faces, your two hearts, one, but always choose the kinder one. The second kind of destructive speech is the tongue that makes great boasts. If flattery is complimenting another person when you don't mean it, boasting is complimenting yourself when there's no need for it, when it doesn't build up or help another person. Here's a litmus test. When you're about to talk about yourself, does what I'm about to say about myself benefit me primarily, or does it benefit the people I'm speaking to? Now, I'm not advocating false humility or selling yourself short. If you're in a job interview situation, speaking confidently about what you have done and what you can do actually is helpful to the person who is interviewing you and trying to get a sense of those things. If someone is having a heart attack, saying, I'm a doctor, if you are a doctor, is not boastful, it is critically helpful. But saying, I'm a pretty big deal, when the purpose is primarily to make yourself feel good or to make someone else feel small. Well, that's the tongue that the psalmist and pretty much everyone else would rather have cut off. The third kind of destructive speech is those who say, with our tongues, we will prevail. Let me confess. I am so guilty of this one. Because there's not much difference at the end of the day between a person with strong muscles who punches you in the face to get his way and a person who uses his word to punch you in the face to get his way. I grew up in a family of six very smart people and I learned early on how to argue effectively. And I often use that skill to my advantage. I've considered often that preaching a sermon every Sunday where I have to get up here and encourage everyone, including myself, to be nice might actually be my eternal penance for the ways I often use my words the other six days of the week. In any case, the litmus test is the same. Am I using my words to advance myself so that I win the argument and you lose? Or am I using my words to help both of us to win? Or to help you win in cases where I really don't need to, even though I like to? The fourth kind of destructive speech that Psalm 12 talks about is those who say, our lips are our own. Who is our master? This, I think, is the most, most destructive of all kinds of speech. Unrestrained words from those who don't consider or just don't care about the impact of their words on other people. We have an expression for this kind of person. We say that he or she has no filter. And some people in our culture take that as a badge of honor. I'm just being honest. 
or it's a free country, I can say what I want. Now, I do believe passionately as an American in free speech. But just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean that it's always helpful or wise or good. As an American, I am free. But as a Christian, I am not free. I have a master. It's the God who tells me to love my neighbor as much as I love myself with my thoughts, with my actions, and with my words. Verse 5 is God's response to the psalmist's prayer. Because the poor are despoiled, because the needy groan, I will now rise up, says the Lord. I will place them in the safety for which they long. The poor and the needy, in Hebrew, the anihim and ebyonim, here refer not so much to financial poverty, but in the context of the psalm, to those who are on the wrong end of destructive speech, those who have been wounded by the words of others. And this is an important thing to remember. Whenever you use, use words destructively, God is automatically on the side of the other person. You may win your argument, but you lose in the sight of God. Destructive words are empty and worthless. But by contrast, verse 6 tells us that the promises of God are pure, like silver refined and purified seven times over. In other words, God's words are valuable, reliable, beautiful. Now the next verse, verse 7, seems like it would be the perfect and typical ending for a psalm. You, O Lord, will protect us. You will guard us from this generation forever and ever. Amen. Roll the credits. But that's not where the psalm ends. There's one more verse. Verse 8. And we find that the psalm ends right with the same sentiment it began. Verse 8. On every side, the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among humankind. The end. Doesn't sound like a great ending for a psalm, but I think ending here is a reminder to us that even when you do what's right, even when your words are kind and uplifting, we still live in a broken, imperfect world. One where self-interest, self-love, usually prevail. Given that fact, why then should we choose to be different from those in the world around us? I want to answer that with a story. I've shared this story with you before, but one more time won't hurt you. A man was praying one day and asked the Lord to explain to him the difference between heaven and hell. The Lord said to the man, come, and I will show you hell. Together they entered a room where a group of people sat around a giant, mouth-watering plate of food. Everyone was famished, desperate, and starving. Each person held a fork that reached all the way to the plate, but all of the forks had handles much longer than their arms, and so none of them could get the forks, could use it, they couldn't use it to get the food into their mouths, and so the suffering was terrible. After a while, the Lord said, Come, now I will show you heaven. Together they entered another room. It was almost identical to the first room. The same plate of food, the same long-handled forks, but a different group of people. And here, everyone was well-fed and happy. I don't understand, said the man. Why are they so happy here when they were so miserable in the other room? And everything is pretty much exactly the same. The Lord smiled and said, Here they use their forks 
to feed each other. People of First Presbyterian Church, may you always use your words, your speech, to help each other, to feed each other, so that this can be heaven on earth. Let us pray. Lord God, you have given us a great and powerful gift in the gift of speech, in the gift of words and eloquence. And yet, how often do we abuse that beautiful gift and use it for ugly things? Turn us around, Lord. Give us a new heart and the desire to speak well of others to speak kindly to others, to let no foul words, no destructive speech come out of our mouths. And in that way, we can share the love that you have given us with everyone we meet. We pray all of these things just as you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God calls us as followers of Christ to be witnesses to his love, his compassion, and his blessing to everyone we meet. In the week to come, may your words to others reflect that blessing, and may you walk in the light of his glory.